Why don't you please stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. Our first reading is taken from Romans 8, 1 to 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And then furthermore, uh, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say in responses to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And lastly, Acts chapter 10, verse 15. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Last week we talked about uh, Jesus' teaching uh, that we're to make amends with others for wrongs we have uh, done to them. And my first inclination this week was to follow with a sermon on our forgiving wrongs that have been done to us. Uh, But God put something else on my heart. At least I pray it was God. Uh, Early in the week, my morning devotional noted what the author uh, felt is the almost universal inability of people to forgive themselves. And the next day, a book on prayer that I'm reading talked about those who struggle with feelings of shame and self-hatred. And then I stumbled on a message from Charles Stanley about self-forgiveness. And those triggered in me a memory of something I read almost uh, 20 years ago now. It's a quote from a psychologist and Christian named Carl Jung. It's about living the Christian life. And he said this, that I feed the hungry that I forgive an insult, that I love my enemy in the name of Christ, all these are great virtues. What I do to the least of my brethren, I do to my Lord. But what if I should discover that the least among them all, the, the poorest of all the beggars, the most impudent of all the offenders, the very enemy himself, that these are within me, and that I myself stand in need of the alms of my own kindness, that I myself 
and the enemy to be loved. What then? What then when we condemn and rage against ourselves? What then? Our third sermon in this series on success in the eyes of God is about uh, forgiving ourselves. Might we join in prayer? Dear risen Lord, may your risen word take flesh this day among us. Lift our hearts today with the truth of your grace and your love. Show us this day the the breadth and depth of your grace among us and your love for us. In, In your holy name we pray. Amen. One of the Olympic stories that stands out in my mind concerns a figure skater named Michelle uh, Kwan. Uh, Michelle, she actually has earned more medals uh, than any uh, American figure skater. But she never won an individual uh, gold medal. And she was heavily favored to win one in, in 1998. And, of course, even though she was quite young then, still in her teenage year, she had worked long hours most days of the week and had given up things that most teenagers take for granted to train toward uh, that goal. And she received, as the media is wont to do, a lot of hype Uh, about being such a clear, clear favorite. And she did skate well, but she lost to a young lady named Tara Lupinski. And uh, afterward, of course, the microphones came, and uh, she was crying. She was very uh, graceful in in the defeat, and she uh, congratulated uh, Miss Lipinski on, on winning. And then right after that, she spoke to her coaches and her family. And she uh, thanked them and told them that she loved them. And, and then she said in a voice, it was really uh, so quiet, quiet as a whisper, that she almost had to lip read it. She said, I hope you can still love me. You know, she had risen really to the height of all her work on a world stage and was still unsure about herself and thought that her love depended on a piece of metal or the judgment uh, of others. And I pray that she uh, and each of us might come to base our view of ourselves and our worthiness on on God's view uh, of us. Uh, That's a truth, though, that many Christians grapple with, and some never understand, that God loves and accepts us uh, as we are. That tends to baffle some of us find it hard to believe. There's a Methodist pastor named Maxie Dunham who tells a story about a friend of his. She's a former Catholic nun. She's actually became a program director in a Methodist church. Her name is uh, Mary Levac. And she entered the convent when she was still young. She was still in her teenage years. And she shared with uh, Pastor Dunham the reason she had gone into seminary, or rather into the convent and, and become a nun, was she felt she needed to make up for her sins. And she was going to go there to make up for her sins. And it, when she went into a seminary, into the convent though, uh, she had this period of depression and self-hatred descend upon her again. 
And five years after she entered the convent, she, she ran away. And the feelings got worse. She thought that she had divorced God and was beyond God's love. So she went back into the covenant, covenant, and she wept, and she prayed, and she cried, and she entered into counseling with a Catholic priest. And she confessed that she had come to the convent and had come back because she needed to make up for these sins. And he started crying. And he, and he said, oh my God, don't let anybody ever tell you Jesus tells you to do that. You don't have to do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Just receive his forgiveness. And, and that word of the Lord... Uh, changed her heart then and, and she came to know the truth that we're loved as we are from birth and there's nothing we can do in the words of Romans to separate ourselves from the love of God there's a story in the Bible in Matthew 8 and Luke 7 and they both tell about a centurion whose uh, servant was ill, and he went to Jesus, uh, asked Jesus, you know, please heal my, my servant. And he, and he said, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you now. But say the word, and, and it will be done. And Jesus said the word, and the servant was healed. But you see, he also spoke the word of worth to that centurion, that he was worthy to come to Christ as he was. Jesus has already said the word. He is the word that you are worthy, that you are loved, that you are accepted that he came for you. And we dwell on the truth that he died for our sins, but you see, he, he also rose that we might join together with God in eternal life, beginning now. That's good news. You know, for God so loved the world. Now, of course, people are stubborn and, and, and hard-headed, and I'm not just talking about anybody in particular. Uh, so we insist, well, no, I am still not worthy. I am the exception to that, that people can't really love me. And, of course, that's not true. There, there's a scene in a Broadway musical called Godspell. Has anybody seen Godspell? And it's in, toward the end of the of the uh, play and Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples it's the night of the last supper and after the supper is over uh, something happens you see the, the disciples have been there and their faces have been painted like clowns and, and, and you see the, the reason for that is it's symbolic of the truth that we hide our real selves from God that our real selves might be an embarrassment uh, to us. So after the supper was over, Jesus takes a bucket of water and a rag, and he goes to each disciple and in turns washes the paint away. And then he gets a mirror and takes it around to them so they can see themselves as, as he sees them. And then he hugs each of them, you know, showing vividly, I think, you know, God's acceptance of them, them who were shortly thereafter even going to abandon him and run away and desert him. And he still loved 
them. You know, they don't have to wear false faces. They don't have to hide their inadequacies. And neither do we uh, before God. See, we don't have to play pretend. God loves and accepts us just as we are. That's even in spite of the American obsession with looks in, in youth and smooth, unwrinkly, uh, unpimpled skin and rippling muscles like these guns here, right? <laughs> See, <clears throat> God's love even includes us at our worst. God has taken the worst humankind could do and the worst we can do and buried it in a tomb and rise again. That's the core truth of the Christian message that in this world of so much darkness that the love of God shines out and triumphs over all for eternity. <clears throat> you know, if there's something you have said or done that clings to your soul like Velcro, uh, that, that withers it to a virtual non-existence, um, God forgives that. There's a, there's a woman, a, a parent, who had the worst thing happen to her that a parent can imagine. She and her husband were at a lake one weekend, and they were with their three young children. They were water skiing, and she was driving the boat. And one of her sons was being pulled, and, and he fell. So you know, she circled back around to pick him up, and as he was getting in, she inadvertently fell on the throttle. You know, you don't have to describe what happened, but he didn't survive. And, and she couldn't function after that. And she had to be hospitalized. And when she got out, she still had this shock and guilt that uh, was just with her, just now part of her being. And she went into the minister, and an interesting thing happened there. She said, I can't go on like this. You know, I need to die. I can't forgive myself. He said, you're right. You cannot forgive yourself. You'll never be able to do so. So she was shocked, and, you know, she doesn't hear those words, didn't expect them from a pastor. And she said, what do you mean I can't forgive myself? Like, never? And he said, that's right. Never. You'll never be able to forgive yourself. And he said, but you can receive God's forgiveness. See? And that will set you free. I pray that she did. You see, God loves us and accepts us as we are and forgives the worst we can do you know, when we turn to him. God loves and accepts and forgives the totality of us. Our, our greatest strengths our worst weaknesses, our most heinous of sins. We have to dare to believe. If you struggle with that, if you struggle with loving yourself, dare to believe words like St. Paul said. He said, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature, and the old has passed away. God was in Christ he wrote, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Dare to believe the words of Christ. He's the one who said these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will never die, but will have eternal life. 
And, and Paul adds, there's absolutely nothing you can do to separate yourself from God's love. The only thing you can do, and too many do it, is you shut your eyes to the truth. We're accepted. We're loved. We're forgiven. Our call is to believe, you know, to forgive ourselves, to accept ourselves, and to live as one of God's beloved. Let's pray. Holy God, we give thanks for life, for love, for grace, for acceptance, for forgiveness. Help us to believe where we do not believe. Help us to not cripple ourselves with self-hatred or limitation, but to live to the fullest as your redeemed and beloved children. Amen.